Dante. You need to save her. You need to save everyone, even those who were wrong. Got a monster inside of me. You better watch out if your enemies are over ahead of full prophecy to be the greatest beast the world has ever seen. I feed him every day like the bones clean. I feed him all the hate and he grows me. And he gets caught real big, pissed off quick. And if you cross him, you might drop dead. Metaphorically, of course, settle in the score. Never getting bored, lots of blood and gold. Always wanting more freedom from the source. They don't really listen until they feel the force of body. And if you start shit, you'll be heartless in the darkness. Torn apart quick, you left scars ripped to be chewed up and discarded. And this world ain't bright, won't accept it Negative energy, I expect it Once it's in your mind, it's infectious So fight for your life and reject it You better give me space, I'm protective My adrenaline spikes when I'm threatened And if you stay in my way, I'm aggressive Cause when there's no eggs, it'll kill when I'm desperate A man was running dragging a little girl amidst the chaos of flames and screams. As he ran, carrying a bloody axe, he shouted, They are crazy! Everyone has gone mad! The little girl, dressed in a blue dress with pink hair, was trying to keep up with him as she was pulled by the hand, crying, Daddy, where are we going? Why is everyone around us screaming? The man turned, seeing demonic shadows emerging behind them in the flames, and replied, To a place where you can survive. This is the only way to keep you alive now. He approached a portal bound with chains, dirty with blood inscriptions, and declared, And I will do it, by freeing him. He buried his axe into the chains, starting to break them. One of the enemy arrows hit him in the chest, piercing him. The man gritted his teeth as he sweated and bled and raised his axe again, thinking, I can't fall yet. Yezzy still needs me. I must keep her alive. And then, finally breaking the chains in front of him, he shouted, Open for me! The sealed doors opened after the chains were broken, and the man gently pushed the girl, saying, Get in quickly, Yezzy! The little girl turned and asked, What's happening? Daddy, are you hurt? The father locked the door behind them, crossing a board over the handles, and replied, Don't ask questions. Quickly find the chained man inside the house. Yezzy ran off in search of what her father had asked, and crawled trembling until she found a shoe wrapped in a red aura, with chains around it. Touching the foot, the girl said, I found the chain and it looks like there's a foot next to it. Is it him? The father turned and said, yes, it's him. Only he can save us now. In front of them was a man completely bound in chains, wearing a long coat. He was pouring a sip of wine into his mouth, sitting on an old wooden bench. The demon hunter, Dante Vandal. Still with the drink dripping from his lips, Dante looked at the man with disdain and said, save you? Why should I? In the past, I protected you for three years, but you chose to believe a stranger a missionary instead of me. Dante crushed the bottle beside him with his hands and declared, It was you who locked me here. You heard slanders and wanted to hand me over to bounty hunters. He stood up from the chair and pointed his finger at the child's father, accusing, When you humiliated me, you were among them. And now you want me to save you? Why should I? The father trembled, stammering, trying to find a plausible argument in the face of those accusations. Outside, a voice could be heard saying, Someone is blocking the way inside. Someone go find a tool. And suddenly, three sharp irons pierced the door, impaling the man's chest. Dante merely watched as the man fell to his knees, leaving three dirty bloodstains on the door. An eye appeared, looking through the hole, and a voice said, You stabbed me! There's still blood in this hole! Let me taste this blood! Outside, mutant humans with tentacles and bubbles protruding from their bodies licked the blood, laughing and saying dubious phrases like, Don't rush, my tongue will reach deeper. As the mutants' tongues danced in the holes of the door, searching for more traces of blood, the man lifted his head, trembling, and spoke. Yes, I truly humiliated you. Back then I believed the lies of the missionary. I really thought that by handing you over, Kimmel would bring us the gospel. I was wrong, Dante. I know I don't deserve your salvation. He looked at Dante, crying, and offered his sword, saying, But what about the child? Dante, the child is innocent. I beg you, Dante, save the child! His little daughter ran to him, worried, not understanding the situation, saying, Daddy, why are you crying? Daddy, don't cry. The father extended the sword and lifted his head with a determined look, saying, As a father, I will repay you with my death. Dante slowly took the sword from the father's hands and said, You, what is the purpose? The wood that locked the door broke in half, and a crowd with pitchforks and lynching weapons appeared, shouting, Finally, the door is open. Yay, I still want to lick the blood. Cayenne light bonds wrapped around Dante, breaking all the remaining chains. He looked at the crowd of mutants, with tentacles emerging from every part of their bodies, and said, I warned you long ago not to trust that missionary Kimmel. And what happened? 
Look at what his gospel has turned you into. Dante pointed the sword at the mutants and declared, Although I don't expect you to understand human language, the rules still need to be declared. Those who leave on their own will live. The mutants ignored his warnings and burst through the door, shouting, Let me in first! There's still a little girl in there, yay! Let me in first, I want to suck the stinky foot of that big man! Dante held the sword, and the zombies were reflected in the blade. Then he declared, Those who advance will die! The mutants ignored his warnings and fiercely charged toward him. Dante cut each one of them down, swinging his sword in front of him. The mutants were sliced apart as Dante moved through the crowd of enemies, sending each of them back. Dante reached a point where there were barrels of wine, tore off the head of one of the mutants, and threw it, breaking one of the barrels and causing the wine to gush out. The mutants became soaked in wine and the floor filled with the alcoholic beverage. Dante scraped his dagger against the sword he held. The friction of the two blades created sparks that flew toward the flammable liquid. Fire began to consume the entire place. The mutants were lost in the flames while Dante thought, The world is vast. Demons are countless. A thought of worldly desire. A thought of madness. When you look back at the flourishing beauty of the world, only then do you realize that the path beneath your feet is one that seeks death. Standing before a charred body, Dante lit a cigarette and said, The rules have been declared. If you advance, it's no longer my fault. He then turned, looking at the man on his knees. With the cigarette between his fingers, he lamented, What a shame. If only I had acted sooner. He placed the cigarette in the mouth of the already lifeless man who was still kneeling. The little girl clung to his arm, scared and not understanding what had happened. She looked at Dante, holding her father's arm tightly, and asked, What happened to my dad? Why isn't he talking? Dante took the girl's hand and replied, He has embarked on a journey to a very beautiful place. As the mutants continued to burn, Yezi followed Dante, asking, What place? Is it far? The man answered, Very, very far. Looking up, Yezi asked again, Will we go there too? Holding the girl's hand firmly yet gently, Dante replied, Sooner or later, but I will definitely arrive before you. I promise. It was then that a voice emerged, making him freeze. Look, Dante! Dante stopped in shock. He recognized that voice speaking in a malicious tone. How can you bear to kill my good follower? Dante turned, saying, Missionary Quimel! Behind him, in front of the gate they had crossed, stood a man in the center of a circle of teeth and fire. The man, dressed in a white suit and red scarf, opened a book with his bandaged hands and said, If you have such a problem with my gospel, why not listen to me speak a few words? He extended the cross hanging from his neck. Dante turned to the girl and said, Go hide somewhere else first. This has nothing to do with a child. Yezi turned her back, pouting, and began to walk away, saying, I'm not a child. My name is Yezi. Zombies appeared behind Kimel, who adjusted his glasses, smiling, and said, Why are you treating me so harshly, Dante? I helped guide the townspeople who betrayed you to the right path. For you and for me, this is a blessing. Dante advanced toward him, drawing his sword and attacking, aiming the blade at the missionary's neck, saying, A blessing? Your head! Kimel stopped the sword with his hand, squeezing the blade around it, letting a lava-like substance drip down, exuding his evil aura, and declared, What do you think I am? A goblin? A hobgoblin? You have no idea what kind of divine power the being I believe in has granted me. Some things cannot be killed with a sword. Kimmel summoned several arms with hands that emerged from his body, extending around him and declared, And when you realize this, it will be too late. The sin of arrogance comes from the abyss. The arms began to attack, trying to impale Dante, who dodged, leaping from side to side. Finding a gap in the attacks, Dante reached for the round bottle hanging from his waist, which contained a green liquid, and muttered to himself, Damn, what trick is this? No matter what kind of divine power he has, as long as he can bleed, then he can die. Dante threw the bottle, shouting, Gollum card bomb potion. A huge cloud of green smoke erupted, rising toward the sky, while Kamel coughed in the midst of it, covering his nose with his book and complaining. Damn, I remember that this brand of potion didn't produce such a big smoke cloud, this rotten egg smell. Are you using expired potions against me? Dante quickly cut the space between them and appeared behind him, pointing his sword at the missionary's neck with a mischievous smile, saying, Treacherous tactics are often very effective. Seeing the blade so close to his neck, Kimel tried to speak. Wait, I have a condition. But coming straight from Aaron Yeager's school, Dante didn't give him time for any movement, and swiftly finished Kimel off, cutting his throat. Kimel complained, Just cutting my throat like that. You bastard, you have no sense of justice. I even had two lines prepared to say. As the missionary's body fell to the ground, Dante replied, bathed in light, save them for the next life. And just before dying, in his last seconds, Kimel declared, 
damn, now I have to find a new city to get a job. Dante heard a murmur with his name, laments that seemed to call him. He turned, seeing the zombies of the townspeople, and said, You, you all. The zombies slowly began to walk toward him, saying, Dante, we were wrong, Dante. We shouldn't have accepted God's blessing. We shouldn't have offended you. It's very painful. Please, save this city. Suddenly, Kimel's voice echoed, bringing Dante's attention back. Kumel gradually rose from the ground, levitating while crimson hands lifted him, declaring, laughing, From the very beginning there was no way you could win this fight. I am the Archbishop of Wu Fen, and you are just a fallen demon hunter from a small town. You can kill an evil person, a demon, a beast. But tell me, Dante, how do you kill a belief? Dante jumped toward him, attacking and saying, As expected from a charlatan, damn, you talk too much. Dante advanced, delivering several blows face to face with Kimel, who countered blocking all with his crimson arms. As the two exchanged blows frantically, Quimel said, Still whining? Don't you realize? The reason I've toyed with you until now is that I know you're different from those greedy townspeople. I just can't convince you to listen to my speech. Quimel blocked Dante's attack with his arm, while the hunter forced the sword and said, They aren't greedy, it's your hypocritical face that deceived them. Then Dante stabbed his sword into Quimel's foot and delivered several punches to his face and chest. He then pulled his sword back and slashed multiple times in an X shape, slicing Kimel before him. But it was useless. The missionary's cuts closed up, and he brought forth a floating zombie boy, enveloped in his power, while saying, So I want you to witness the power of the god of Wu Fen with your own eyes. The boy slowly approached, crying and repeating, Mom, where are you? Until Kimel declared, The sin of arrogance from the abyss! And a mouthful of teeth opened in the middle of the boy's head, giving way to an abyssal being a red creature full of mouths that stretched toward the sky, emerging from the boy who thrashed and screamed, the abyssal being writhed, attacking from side to side, burying itself in the ground and trying to reach Dante, who ran, dodging while thinking, this guy, is he a magician? But I don't see anything like a wand. Kimel laughed and replied, magic, who cares about using such a useless thing? Open your eyes and see clearly, Dante, this is the true divine power that exists in this mortal world. Behind him appeared countless red arms, zombies, and abyssal beings, a hellish scene controlled by the emissary. The arms began to attack Dante again, who defended himself, parrying the blows with his sword and dodging while Kamel lectured. I sincerely hope you can join us, Dante. If you don't understand, I would be happy to explain our power to you. As long as you are willing to sacrifice your sanity, the god of Wu Fen will grant you specific powers. But this power can only be controlled if you sacrifice your sanity. In most cases, the consequence of sacrificing sanity is becoming an uncontrollable madman. But under the guidance of the great Pope, we developed a skill that can completely control this power. I call this skill dumbing down intelligence. One of the tentacles managed to wrap around Dante, pulling him closer to Kumel and presenting the hunter before the missionary. Dante turned his face unimpressed and replied, Dumbing down intelligence? What kind of stupid name is that? Kimel felt offended and declared, I spent three days and nights thinking of this name. Do you know how much effort I put into convincing the whole church to use my name? But he quickly regained his composure and said, Anyway, as long as you join Wu Fen, I will personally teach you how to dumb down intelligence. So, what do you think? Tempted? Dante spat in Kimel's face as the tentacles tightened around him and said, I have nothing to discuss with a cult. Kimel presented the cross hanging from his neck, irritated, and said, A cult? We are an official church registered with the council. We have a special church emblem. The Pope and I designed the church robes together. We even have pamphlets made by ourselves. He then stretched out a pamphlet with hand-drawn illustrations that read, Wu Fen Doctrine refuses to share the world with fools. Return to the new world before your eyes. Wu Fen is the future. Join the lecture and receive three eggs, limited edition. Invite new believers and earn 70 copper coins. Kimel smiled proudly and said, What do you think? Isn't it excellent? I participated in everything, from the paper to the composition, font, and color combination. Dante, however, replied, This paper will definitely lose its color if you use it to wipe your ass. Kamel crumpled the paper, the veins on his face bulging with irritation, gritting his teeth and launching the tentacles toward Dante, saying, Wipe! Wipe your ass! You! You can insult me personally, but you cannot insult my ideals. I am tired of sharing this world with vulgar fools like you. Wu Fen will create a great new world, and I will not allow you to insult it. Dante's body sank into a crater, and Kimel walked up to him, saying, Why does everyone laugh at me? Why do you laugh at everything I do? Ah, it's a pity that the church superiors instructed me to spare your life. At first I thought they wanted me to recruit you, but now I understand. 
One of the arms lifted Dante's head, and Kimel looked at him with a malevolent gaze and a sadistic smile, saying, You need to stay alive, Dante. Only then will you be able to witness our ascension with your own eyes. He then stood up and ordered, Take that girl. Hua needs a subject for her experiment. The mutants grabbed Yezi and forcibly took her away. While Dante tried to protest, but his weak voice barely came out and his body did not respond, the rain began to fall, soaking the place. Kimmel smiled at the sky, victorious, and said, The era of swords and spears is over, Dante, and you have been left behind. Dante slowly stretched out his hand, trying to grasp the hilt of his sword. Gradually, he attempted to reach it while thinking, I don't have the strength to get up. This missionary, what is he? My city, my home, those who once trusted me. Without strength, he fell unconscious, leaving his sword by his side. Two figures appeared near him. The figures approached as voices said, That? Counselor Valkyrie, this is the city of Tang Ze, where the disturbance occurred. There is a survivor here. One of the figures was a knight in armor with red eyes, who picked up Dante's body in his arms with one hand and said, I recognize him. He is the demon hunter Dante Vander. Someone has already told me legendary stories about his past. That was Paladin Vaughn Lionheart, warm-hearted but even hotter in his armor. Vaughn walked up to Valkyrie. The figure mounted on a horse with an umbrella and asked, Should we take him back as a survivor? However, she replied, Survivor? No, we don't need survivors. Take him back as a prisoner. She was a woman with a mask, purple glasses, red hair, and cross earrings. It was Valkyrie. Those who stand by her live a fate worse than death, and those who oppose her usually die imperial magistrate. Back at the imperial royal prison of the city of Nirvana, it was already night, and Valkyrie was walking through the prison corridors accompanied by Vaughn. With her hand resting on her sword at her waist, Valkyrie inquired, Has the criminal Dante Vandel who massacred the city of Tangze been settled in? Holding a folder of documents, Vaughn replied behind her, Yes, I instructed guard garrison to treat Dante well. And she, with her little rabbit keychain hanging from her katana, declared, Good. First, increase your goodwill towards us, and future cooperation will come naturally. Upon reaching the guard's room in question, Valkyrie found him holding a whip of thorns and a hot iron. The guard looked at her from beneath a grim mask and said, Ah, Lady Valkyrie, perfect timing. You arrived just in time for my reception. Would you like to entertain him personally? I suggest starting by burning his left testicle. The weak point of most men is there. Valkyrie entered the room and covered her eyes, cursing. Burn my ancestors. In front of her was Dante hanging on a cross, completely pierced by chains, naked and marked by torture. Valkyrie turned and said, Vaughn, drag Garrison to the square and whip him until I'm out, and find a new pair of pants for Dante. As Vaughn dragged the guard by his coat, he screamed, Weren't you the one who wanted me to treat him well? If that's not enough, I have harsher methods. Harsher methods. Valkyrie handed a pair of pants to Dante and turned so he could dress, saying, Sorry, my subordinates are a bit undisciplined in their actions. That wasn't my intention, Dante replied. I understand, Valkyrie. We've known each other for quite some time now. When I first met you, you were just a 16-year-old girl. Since then, you've been full of lies. He spat blood, showing disdain, and the girl bent down, picking up the hot iron and saying, Come back and work for me. You worked only a few days a year, and I gave you paid leave for the rest. Dante began to bandage his wounds and said, Work for you? You'd better hurry and hang me outside. I don't work for frauds. Valkyrie pointed the iron at him, bringing the hot part close to his face and declared, I didn't ask for your opinion. This is an order. Or should I continue with what guard garrison left unfinished? Start by burning your left testicle until you agree to work for me. Dante closed his fist close to the hot iron. Steam rose, indicating his hand was burning. And he replied, I don't care. You can't threaten someone who has nothing left. Then he ripped the iron from her hand and threw it towards the wall, saying, Get out now! Valkyrie picked up an orange flower in her hand and smiled, saying, You're still as impulsive as ever, Dante. How about we make a deal? Just like before, you help me with some insignificant issues, and I'll help you find that little girl and clear your name. She handed the flower to Dante, who took it and said, Yezi, you know the girl's name? And Valkyrie replied, still smiling, Female intuition, is that an acceptable explanation? Dante closed his fist around the flower, crushing it, and replied, Give me a reason to trust you. Valkyrie then stretched out a poster with several childlike drawings that said, Daddy, they are reprimanding Dante. They didn't used to be like this. I believe Dante is not a bad person. He is the hero of the city. While speaking, Valkyrie said, Because you want to believe, Dante. You need a chance to redeem your mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes, but not everyone has the courage to correct them. You don't want to spend the rest of your life regretting, do you? Dante took the sheet and folded it, saying, 
I will accept this order, but this is the last time between us. Valkyrie approached Dante and took his hand, turning the burned palm towards her. As she began to treat the burns, she declared, Things are different now, Dante. There are many new things you need to adapt to. By the way, the Wu Fen Doctrine Church is also my enemy. When I was very young, my family was expelled from our lands by the Wu Fen Doctrine Church. My parents desperately protected me while I was being sent out of the mansion, but they... She spilled a vial of green liquid into the palm of Dante's hand, causing him to grit his teeth. The girl interrupted her speech and said, The medicine will sting a bit. Hold on. The emperor took pity on my situation and allowed me to inherit my father's title, which gave me my current position. The way I treated you back then was largely for self-preservation. Dante became angry at the last part of her statement as she wrapped his hand and said, Oh yes, you preserved yourself while I was thrown into the city of Tangze like trash. Valkyrie placed a bunny sticker on Dante's bandaged hand and said, I'm sorry, whether for burning your hand or for what happened in the past. She then turned, walking toward the illuminated door, saying, But people, everyone must face the mistakes they've made, right? Dante looked at his bandaged hand, saying, The courage to correct one's own mistakes, that... Dante followed Valkyrie as they walked toward the prison exit. Passing by a guard, Valkyrie extended a paper, saying, This is a pardon personally signed by the emperor. And Dante commented, So you had everything prepared all along. The guard authorized their exit, saying it was fine and indicating the way. Dante approached Valkyrie and smiled mischievously, saying, You had already predicted that I would leave with you, hadn't you? Liar, Valkyrie. The girl smiled and replied, I'm not a liar, Dante. I just choose to conceal certain truths. You insisted on uncovering things that were against your own interests. Crossing the courtyard, the two passed by Vaughn, who was whipping the guard. Valkyrie ordered, Come on, Vaughn, the job is done. And finishing the lash, the paladin replied, Understood, Lady Valkyrie. Dante smiled, giving a thumbs up to the paladin while the guard trembled with pleasure, saying, Don't be in such a hurry to leave. At least stay for dinner. Being whipped by Lady Valkyrie is an honor for me, Garrison. Getting into the carriage, Valkyrie asked, So when will you change your attitude towards me? And Dante replied, When you stop lying to me. The girl argued, All officers tell a few lies. And Dante said, But you lie the most. But you lie the Once inside, the two sat facing each other. On the table in front of him were his coat, his sword, and a canteen. Dante looked at the items and commented, Oh, aren't these the old companions you took from me in the past? I thought those things were tossed in the Emperor's dungeon. Valkyrie replied, arms crossed. They were, but this job was personally ordered by the Emperor himself. So can you get them back? Dante put on his coat and embraced his sword, bringing it close to his blushing face, saying, So I should bring two bottles of wine to thank him someday? Ah, seeing this reminds me of the old times. Valkyrie commented, We worked well together back then, didn't we? And Dante replied, We worked well, my ass. It was just you screwing me over. Valkyrie leaned over the table and presented a pamphlet, similar to the one the missionary had shown Dante earlier, and said, I found this in the city of Tongze. What do you think of the Church of the Wu Fen Doctrine? Our protagonist replied, That, unlike other sects, most sects use dark magic or witchcraft to create miracles and deceive their followers. But the power of Wu Fen is not magic. It's a new kind of strength, a strength that is beyond my understanding. Valkyrie declared, The Church of the Wu Fen Doctrine has been very secretive within the Empire, and there are almost no survivors in the places they operated. In the last 20 years, you have been the only one to survive an encounter with the Church of the Wu Fen Doctrine. And Dante replied, They deliberately spared me, but I don't know the exact reason. Valkyrie then spread a pile of case files on the table and said, Look at these case files. They document. Dante interrupted her, saying, Too many words, I'm not reading. And suddenly he stood up, hitting his head on the ceiling. Valkyrie was puzzled and commented, What's going on? Why are you suddenly standing at attention? Standing, looking ahead as a green arrow flew through the spot where he had just been, Dante exclaimed, If I don't stay like this, my ass will be whipped. It seems someone wants to hitch a ride. The arrow embedded itself in the ceiling and a sonic wave began to echo. The two covered their ears, trying to concentrate and protect themselves from the noise. Valkyrie asked, Where is the enemy? Outside the carriage? Behind? And Dante replied, Wrong. Look at the direction the arrow penetrated. The guest is under the carriage. Dante punched through the carriage floor, grabbing the invader's head as he said, Since you like to hide under the carriage, stay a little longer. The horse pulling the carriage became uncontrollable with the movement. The wheels began to break the ground as it slowly went off the rails. Vaughn complained, What are you doing back there? The carriage is out of control. And Dante replied, Don't worry, I'll control it soon. He raised his sword, preparing to stab the invader. 
However, whoever it was unexpectedly bit his hand. Dante pulled his swollen finger back and complained, startled. That's against the rules. Biting isn't allowed. Is this guy a dog? Valkyrie watched with her arms crossed, looking disappointed. A chain of bones extended, wrapping around the carriage, making it harder for Vaughn to keep it on the road. With the vehicle out of control, he shouted, What's happening back there? Is this your idea of control? As the cabin of the carriage collapsed, Dante replied, You better come back here and take a look before questioning me. Several cuts were made, completely destroying the carriage. It was Dante who had sliced through the cabin from the inside. Amid all the chaos, Valkyrie remained seated, arms and legs crossed, saying, These damages will be deducted from your payment. Dante finished cutting and replied, Say one more word and I'll throw you out too. Suddenly, the invader revealed himself, a being with human skin that was partly translucent green, wearing green clothes with long light brown hair and a chain of bones. The being pulled the chain, which transformed into a bow and arrow, and declared, What's the problem? Afraid of Santu's ambush? Now tie yourself up so I can take you back for the reward. If you don't take the initiative, then Santu will have to do it alone, right? That was Santu, an elf of the red mist. His green eyes had a red mark that Dante had seen before, the cross that Kimel wore around his neck. Dante noticed the mark still under the aim of Santu's arrow and exclaimed, That mark, is she also a member of the Wu Fen Doctrine? Valkyrie poured a little wine into her cup and said, Don't be so aggressive. I feel sorry for my drink. Dante confidently walked towards Santu, saying, Does the Wu Fen Doctrine recruit elves? Two minutes should be enough. Until bringing his hand to his waist, he realized he had no potions left. Finding himself in trouble, he complained, Damn. I forgot I just got out of prison and didn't have time to restock. Can I still ask for overtime? An arrow grazed his face, leaving a scratch, and Dante drew his sword, advancing towards Santu, saying, If there's no long-range option, attack directly. He buried his sword into the elf who blocked the attack with his bow, saying, Not bad, you have skills. No wonder the bounty is so high. Santu grabbed one of the arrows sheathed in green energy and shot it towards Dante with her own hands. Dante caught the arrow before it hit his face, saying, Using arrows in close combat? Smart move, but I've seen that trick before. Dante ignited the arrow in green flames as his eyes glowed with the same flames and said, But have you seen this? Ignorant mistake. He released the arrow and began waving his hand frantically, complaining, Hot, hot, hot. Then the arrow exploded, sending out a cloud of flames and green smoke. Dante screamed as stones shattered and he was hit. Dante paused for a moment, observing and thought, it seems that every member of the Wu Fen Doctrine can gain different abilities by lowering their intelligence. Her ability is to turn arrows into some kind of magic. Either way, I need to find a way to prevent the carriage from falling apart. Dante advanced towards the girl and began to strike, deflecting all the arrows she shot in his direction. Dante thought, this girl has no idea how destructive her techniques are. But since she turns arrows into magic, the best way is to interrupt her spell. He charged again, bearing his sword and Santu crossed her arrows in front of her body, blocking the attack while counting, Eight arrows! Our protagonist then kicked Santu, sending her flying, saying, You're throwing too slowly! As the elf rolled on the ground, Dante thought, At least I can't let this crazy girl hurt Valkyrie. This needs to be a quick fight. Arrows started flying towards him, cutting through the air. Dante observed the projectiles wrapped in green lightning and said, Her speed isn't as fast as I thought. Is she holding back or... Valkyrie remained impassive, sitting on the bench of the crumbling carriage, enjoying her drink, while the arrows hit Dante, exploding in his chest. Our protagonist spat blood, saying, Air explosion! What a crazy girl! Santu stood up, her bow transforming into a whip made of bones, and she threw it towards Dante, saying, Santu will kill you! The whip struck Valkyrie's side, who remained still, holding her cup, while Dante dodged. The whip cracked in all directions, and Santu advanced towards him, holding an arrow aimed at his neck. Dante blocked it, positioning his sword in front of him, and Santu ignited her arrow in green flames again, with a smile on her face, saying, Let's see who lets go first. Both of their hands were trapped in the flames. Dante commented, Damn, my previous burn hasn't healed yet, and now this. The carriage was approaching a tram line, and the signal was closed. The tram was speeding along, heading towards the carriage. Vaughn began to panic, saying, Good horse, be good, slow down a bit. Good horse, good horse, hurry up until he completely surrendered and whipped the poor animal, shouting, Damn! Can't you hear I'm telling you to speed up? The carriage crossed the tram's path, but the back was still in the way. Dante seized the opportunity and grabbed Santu's arm, spinning her with the flaming arrow and launching the elf towards the front of the tram. The impact left the girl completely dizzy and unconscious, ending the fight. 
The group arrived at a tavern with pink lights and bows hanging, along with a unicorn and clouds in front, above the door. Vaughn followed Valkyrie towards the door, saying, We finally reached our destination, but where is Dante? Valkyrie replied, He probably fell behind. Dante appeared behind them, walking and throwing the elf onto the ground, saying, I'm not that easy to shake off. He bent down and started shaking the elf while saying, Hey, wake up! But Santu mumbled, So many stars, am I in the sky? It was then that Dante noticed something. A poster rolled up inside Santu's clothes. He said, Huh? My wanted poster? Opening the poster, he read it and saw a drawing of his face with the words, Wanted. Name, Dante Vander, crime, tax evasion, reward, 1,000 gold coins, signature, Valkyrie. The signature caught his attention, making him boil with rage. He tore the poster, shouting, So it was you who hired her to capture me, and you kept this a secret the whole time. You tricked me into fighting her. Valkyrie calmly swirled her cup, saying, Congratulations, you passed my test. Dante tried to advance towards her, still boiling with anger, shouting, Test what? Now I'm going to test you. Vaughn held him with just one hand, lifting him off the ground, saying, Brother Dante, enough, stop! While he continued shouting, Don't stop me! I'm going to fight her! Valkyrie approached the tavern door and knocked a few times, saying, Calm down, Dante. If you knew what I have prepared for you next, you wouldn't be so violent. A man with a pipe and unshaven beard cracked the door open, shoved a club through the gap, and said, The tavern is closed today. No customers allowed. Unless... Valkyrie blushed with some embarrassment, cleared her throat, and struck a cute heart pose, saying, My little pony, number one in the world. The man replied, Correct password. Vaughn entered the tavern carrying Santu over his shoulders, followed by Dante and Valkyrie, who said, Hurry up and change that stupid password. The owner of the place responded, If it's stupid, then it's safe. Dante took a few steps forward, seeing some eccentric figures scattered around the tavern, and asked, So, what have you prepared for me? Smokers and drunks? Valkyrie adjusted her glasses with her middle finger, saying, Look closely. What I'm giving you is... Valkyrie opened her arms over the group of vagabonds she had gathered, and Dante observed each one while making a comment. Why do the stars smell like smoke? Do angels smoke too? Said Santu, the red mist elf with a strong accent. One more drink. Long live cold beer, said the man in the black hat with a red band and a scarf covering his face. Omond Ironfinger, the head of hunters from the Bounty Association, a professional. Next was a guy with four cigars in his mouth, a tattoo on his arm, and a spiked club. One of the cigars fell and he panicked, saying, Ow, damn, the ash burned my beard. It was Sverin Zephyr, an imperial soldier who had participated in the campaigns of Walden and the Broodmother River, saw more dead than alive. Last but not least, there was him, the paladin, complaining, So hot, so hot, it's always so stuffy in the tavern. Vaughn Lionheart, a crusader, not confirmed, with a warm heart but even warmer inside his armor. Dante looked around with a frustrated smile and said, Team? Huh? Valkyrie began to draw a series of sketches on a blackboard with chalk while explaining, The Wu Fen doctrine is different from other cults. They never promote themselves deliberately. On the contrary, for the past few decades, they have operated mysteriously and impeccably, with almost no one managing to catch them in the act. But Kimael is different. He acts ostentatiously and extravagantly and never cares about the consequences. There's no one better for this mission than him. Your task is to find him and then discover exactly what the Wu Fen doctrine is planning. When Valkyrie finished explaining, the group of mercenaries burst into laughter at the childish drawing on the board. She threw the chalk at them, irritated, saying, Don't laugh. I know my drawing isn't good, but this matter is very important for the security of the Empire. Very important. Then regaining her composure, she said, It doesn't matter. Since I recruited you, I must trust you. When the new carriage I ordered arrives, you will go to the University of Yerevan. Valkyrie walked to the table and handed an envelope with a royal seal to Dante, saying, This is what the interim rector of the University of Yerevan, Mallory, asked me to deliver to you. He requested that you open it as soon as you arrive. Santu stretched to see what was inside the envelope. But before Dante opened it, he questioned, I know you value this mission a lot, but I also have a very important question. What exactly is a university? It was then that Valkyrie realized she was facing five people who had never attended primary school. The girl took a deep breath and picked up the chalk again, returning to explain. Let me clarify. The University of Yerevan is the most luxurious high-level educational institution in the entire empire. It's where all the children of the empire's officials and nobles go for advanced studies. But in a single night, we lost contact with the underground experimental area of the university. 
The empire instantly lost its best batch of students, including the rector of the University of Yerevan Verol. Zephyr took the cigar out of his mouth, about to stub it out on the table. Vaughn rushed to put the ashtray underneath while a man shouted, What is the army doing? Go get the army! Valkyrie turned slightly and replied, Sorry, we can't. The first soldiers who entered didn't come out alive. The only ones who came out alive are still undergoing electrotherapy in a psychiatric hospital. Besides, the empire is still at war, and losing a large number of soldiers under such obscure circumstances would have very bad consequences, especially since this is in the capital right under the emperor's nose, do you understand? She then walked toward the exit, saying, Anyway, the rest depends on you. Golden Pavilion, make me a margarita. And the tavern owner replied while reading the newspaper, Coming right up. Dante made a frustrated pout as Valkyrie went up the stairs and said, Just like before, these days you can't expect much from clients. They briefly explain the mission and then leave. Omond, who was still sitting next to him, stretched a beer toward him, saying, You'll get used to it. Dante took the bottle, saying, So you're a bounty hunter now, Omond? Oman took a sip of his own beer and said, I'm the top bounty hunter, sounds more professional. So you're still a wizard after the Twilight Demon Hunters Guild was disbanded? Dante replied, That's none of your business. Oman pointed the neck of the bottle at Dante and declared, I knew from the start that the Twilight Demon Hunters Guild would disintegrate sooner or later. That's why I was the first to leave. That's what you call professional insight. Dante looked at him with a serious and threatening expression and said, Things are more complicated than you think. After the meteor incident, many things became irreparable. Mention the past again and I'll break your neck. Omen threw his empty bottle over his shoulder and Vaughn made sure to catch it with a trash can, always attentive to avoid messes. Omen smiled and pointed behind him. I'm just teasing you. After all, you didn't curse me when I left, did you? As for those guys, I've been watching them since I arrived. They're a bunch of amateurs. Dante took another sip of his beer and said, You can still observe them. I thought you were already drunk by then. Omond leaned on the table and declared, Pretending to be drunk is a high-level reconnaissance technique used by professional bounty hunters. Dante shrugged, somewhat dissatisfied, and replied, But they're on our side. You could just look at them, and no one would care. Omond crossed his legs, smiling, saying, Because it makes me look more professional. Just listen to me. At a table behind them, Zephyr and Santu were betting on an arm wrestling match. Zephyr smiled, saying, Don't break your little arms and legs. And Santu replied, Arm wrestling. Santu has never lost. Omen then began to comment. The elf named Santu by her age must still be a novice. Elf clans rarely allow such young members to leave their territory unless she has been exiled. And the main reason an elf clan exiles one of its members is due to their weakness. Santu easily pushed her opponent's fist down on the table, making Zephyr shout, How does this girl have so much strength? While Santu celebrated her victory. Oman continued commenting on Zephyr. That old soldier is also a fool. Normally, soldiers in service wouldn't accept mercenary jobs unless they had been sent back from the front lines for cowardice and need to earn some money to get by. Besides, I don't like soldiers much anyway. A bunch of rude and unprofessional people. Next, he spoke about Vaughn, who was cleaning the table, ensuring their base was shining. As for that paladin, he's even more suspicious. All the paladins I've seen are the type that puts themselves in a morally superior position and points fingers. How can he be doing housework? A true paladin wouldn't even brush their teeth. They'd have a servant to do that. So he's also useless. Therefore, in terms of heroes today, it's just you and me. When the real fight begins, we just need to look at each other and forget about those amateurs. Oman slapped Dante on the shoulder, who was scraping the ground with his foot in a strange way, feeling nervous. Then he burst out laughing and Oman asked, What are you laughing at? You saw the Wu Fen doctrine. You know how crazy those people are when they fight. We should focus on the mission. Professionalism. Got it? Dante then poured more beer and replied, I'm laughing because you still think we're on the same side. We're not the same, Omond. I can't become as professional as you. You don't understand my quest. I've spent my whole life searching for the perfect way to die. Once, I wanted to give my life for my comrades in the Twilight Demon Hunters Guild, but we split up before that could happen. I also wanted to give my life for a girl named Yezi, but Kimael deliberately spared me. I'm not worthy of dying. That was his judgment on me. I'm not afraid of dying, Omond. I just don't want to die like trash. A die the carriage arrived, and Dante and Santu were the first to get in while the others struggled to make space. Valkyrie watched the carriage leave from her window, taking a drink, and our protagonist observed the landscape, thinking, I've made many mistakes in life. Mistakes that cost me things far too precious. Valkyrie was right about one thing. The mistakes of the past don't disappear. We must learn to face the past. So, 
No matter what horrors lie beneath the University of Yerevan, I will face them. Inside a dark corridor with bodies hanging from the ceiling, flesh and tentacles stretched out as a pink mosquito flew through the area. The mutant mosquito seemed to be searching for something until an explosion occurred, sending it flying. In the explosion's place appeared a large mouth with teeth, a portal from which Kimael emerged, hands in pockets complaining, Why is it so dark? Where are the people welcoming me? Cornisha! Veril? The light suddenly turned on, blinding Kimael, who shielded his eyes, saying, Damn, what the hell is this? Did the emperor bring his troops? A group of zombies burst out with confetti behind a girl in a dress and hair, carrying a pink cake with a miniature figure of Kimael on top. Above there was a happy birthday banner. The girl smiled, saying, Happy 31st birthday, Master Kimael. This was Cornisha Dawn, indivisible father and self-proclaimed Lady Kimael, a cook so good that most men would fall in love with her. Kimael took the cake and blew out the candles, saying, Birthday, only mediocre people care so much about the day they were born. Cornisha leaned in toward him, smiling, and said, But a wife would care about her husband's birthday. Kimael walked, carrying the cake, and replied, How many times have I told you? Our marriage is just a facade for the mission. It's not officially valid. Cornisha followed him, saying, But the Pope himself officiated our wedding. Kimael placed the cake on a table, saying, That was just to make our act more convincing. Don't mention that farce again. Cornisha then leaned on the table, smiling, and said, Try a piece. I baked it myself. Kimael took a knife and leaned over the cake, saying, I'll try it as long as you stop bothering me. Wait, why does it look like a piece is missing? Behind the cake, there was one less slice. Cornisha then pointed to a creature with crystals growing on its back, sitting on the floor, and said, Hua took a bit when it came out of the oven, sorry about that. The creature with crystals growing on its body and drooling a green substance looked at Kimael, saying, what are you looking at? This is my cake. I marked it with my slime. That was Bishop Hua, the vice president of the University of Yerevan. Dismissed, an advocate for early morning classes. Kimael served a piece of cake and said, Aren't you going to try a piece, Director Verrill? Isn't it tradition for you to share a student's birthday cake? The man dressed in red next to him replied, I'm no longer qualified to be a director. And you, Kimael, you are no longer my student either. That was Verrill Grief the former director of the University of Yerevan, an advocate for conducting training between classes. Verrill turned to him and said, From the moment you killed your classmate, you ceased to be a member of the University of Yerevan. Time for the birthday song. A zombie appeared, clashing cymbals and singing, Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, wishing you happiness and good health. Kimail pointed at him, unsatisfied, and said, He snores, grinds his teeth, and I need to act before that idiot drives me crazy. Kimail then exploded the heads of the zombies present, causing tentacles to grow from them, and said, I never regretted killing him. My only regret is not having made the decision sooner. Red drops rained down in the room, and Cornisha smiled, saying, Wow, is this a rose rain from Master Kimail? Kimail used one of his tentacles to grab a slice and said, Forget it, director. You're already one of us. As long as you can work in peace, that's what matters. Cornisha continued to follow him, enchanted by what she called rose rain. The director opened his book and said, The data on the meteorite still needs more experiments to be confirmed. I still need more time. Kimael took a plate and said, Then you better hurry. I know you saved an entire class of students under the guise of experiments. If you don't finish before the army comes in, I wouldn't mind educating a few more of your students. He then smeared some frosting from the cake. Bishop Hua sneaked up and jumped onto the table, trying to reach the cake. Kimael pushed him away with his tentacles, saying, what the hell? Was this baked for you? Get lost. And the bishop replied, What I see is mine. Mine. He made an okay sign around his tongue, showing a red mark and began an incantation, repeating, Give me the cake. Give me the cake. Give me the cake. The error of arrogance. Useless shelter. The mark 444 appeared in a giant red eye on the ceiling of the room. Kimail quickly looked up, and the director followed his gaze, both with their eyes glowing. They both used seals. The paradigm of arrogance beef abyss, the first seal of emotional arrogance. And they restrained Hua with skeletal hands and red tentacles. Kimael wiped the sweat from his forehead and sighed, saying, I didn't expect this lunatic to use that trick on his own people. Veril, take him to the research area. Don't leave him here. Veril began to walk. And before following, Cornisha handed a large piece of cake to Hua, saying, All right, all right, it's all yours to eat. Hua celebrated, laughing. Yay! Yay! Happy birthday! Kimael slapped his forehead, lamenting, How can I resurrect the church with this bunch of idiots? When the new world is realized, none of these fools will be allowed to survive. 
Suddenly, bodies were thrown to the ground with chains wrapped in green energy. A hulking being, along with two smaller ones, spoke, Chief Kimael, I brought the things you asked for. Sitting on the shoulder of the hulking, deformed mutant was a boy wearing a book mask with a tongue and glasses. Reading a book, he said, Can I go back to reading now? I'm a bit scared in the dark. This was Bottler, the book eater, a high school student who once cried in fear from Mordak's ghost stories. He claims it only happened once. The hulking being declared, Some half-dead bodies, I crushed their bones as you asked. He was the black guard, captain of the security team. The last one on the ground was a boy with purple hair popping a bubble of gum, saying, So next time, can you give this kind of stupid task to someone else? It's really dumb. He was Mordak, the light devourer, a high school student who scared Bottler with ghost stories. More than once. Kamael drove his tentacles into the bodies and said, Good job, but there's no time for complaints. You need to place these bodies all over the underground before the royal guards arrive. Bottler saw the cake on the table and excitedly exclaimed, Wow! A birthday cake! Can I eat it? My family never celebrated my birthday. Mordak picked up the cake and handed it to Bottler, saying, Go ahead. Uncle Kimael wouldn't be mad at two students, right? Bottler took a forkful, smiling brightly, while Kimael opened a map, saying, All right, consider this a reward. Paul, you place the bodies near the entrance walkway. I'll organize some followers nearby to distract them. You wait deep in the passage and kill anyone who enters. The guard pounded his chest and said, Understood. No outside personnel allowed. Kimael then turned to the boy and instructed, Bottler, you guard the library. I've blocked all other routes. They can only enter through the library. The boy repositioned his book on his face and said, Wow, the cake looks so delicious. Did Sister Cornisha make it? You're lucky to marry her. Annoyed, Kimael replied, How many times do I have to tell you we're not a couple? Then regaining his composure, he showed the map to Mordak and said, Mordak, you guard the sewers. It's the only way that connects to the main experimental area. If anything goes wrong, use your ability to blow it up. Mordak was sitting at the table, bouncing his feet restlessly as he spoke. All right, all right, I get it. So boring. I can bake cakes too, you know. Suddenly, the mutant purple mosquito appeared, returning to Kimael, who welcomed it onto his finger, saying, The reconnaissance mosquito came back so quickly. Cornisha approached, drying dishes, and asked, What? The royal guards have arrived? Kimael squished the mosquito and placed it on his tongue with a mischievous smile, saying, No, they're not the royal guards. These people are even more interesting than the royal guards, a group of heretics. But most importantly, that man has arrived. Dante Vander. If you enjoyed today's recap and want more Manhua content, subscribe to the channel. We're starting this journey now, and I hope that together we can strengthen this new community. So go ahead and like the video, comment for future parts, and share it with your friends. Thank you so much for joining us, and until next time.